Tonight is devoted to music, which in the hands of a master structures our experience of time, and David Lang is such a master. He is an endlessly inventive composer, one of the most important musical figures of the age, and I suspect that his exploration of music and, as he says, its secret powers for good and evil will make us hear the world anew. He was born in Los Angeles, educated at Stanford and here at the University of Iowa, where he has just received an alumni award, and teaches in the Yale School of Music. He lives in New York City with his wife, the artist Suzanne Bocanegra, with whom he has three children, one of whom, Ike, is a UI student. Professor Lang has made nearly 100 recordings, and his compositions are performed around the world. He won the Pulitzer Prize in Music in 2008 for The Little Match Girl, based on a fable by Hans Christian Andersen and his own rewriting of, Bach, of the libretto to Bach's St. Pat Matthew's Passion. The recording of this piece won the 2010 Grammy for Best Small Ensemble Performance. In 2013, he was named Musical America's Composer of the Year. He has composed music for film for renowned choreographers like Twyla Tharp, and for a crowd of a thousand. In short, he does it all. On Mother's Day in 1987, Professor Lang and his fellow composers, Michael Gordon and Julia Wolf, presented a 12-hour marathon concert, launching the musical collective known as Bang on a Can, which Vanity Fair has described as, quote, Lollapalooza advised by the ghost of John Cage. <laughs> Bang on a Can commissions new composers, performs and records new works, develops audiences and educates musicians for the future, in its own words, building a world in which powerful new music ideas flow freely across all genres and borders. In its dedication to making music new, Bang on a Can has attracted a global following, alerting listeners to different ways of apprehending the world. Professor Lang held the composer's chair at Carnegie Hall in 2013-14, where he created a festival to showcase different modes of storytelling in music. Of collected stories, he said, because my music has been about questioning some of the things in the mainstream, asking whether mainstream things can actually build bridges to other kinds of musical worlds, the opportunity to do this on a bigger scale is something I've been waiting for my whole life. And perhaps we ourselves have been waiting all our lives to hear David Lang build bridges to some of the many worlds of music he inhabits. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you very much. Does this work? Yeah. Is it on? OK. That was very nice. Thank you. I'm very sweet. So um, you know, I sort of um, made a big mistake, which was that I didn't realize I was going to be giving a lecture to a lot of people. I thought I would be talking to a couple of people, and that half of them would be sleeping. <laughs> so I didn't really prepare anything. You know, I was told I'm supposed to give a lecture on creativity. And I was asked to give it a title, so I thought, well, if I called it Lecture on Creativity, no one would come. So I called it Music and Its Secret Powers for Good and Evil. <laughs> but I never expected that I would actually have to give it. So, um, so you'll have to forgive me a little bit. I, I'm going to be working my way through this. So the format is I'm going to blather for a little bit. Then we're going to play some music, and then hopefully we'll have some questions. So start thinking about your questions now, OK? Um, it's true I am a composer. Um, that part is true. Um, about creativity, um, which I think is sort of the general tenor of what all of these topics are for everyone who is coming here. We're supposed to talk somehow about creativity. I'm not sure I know what to say about creativity. I can tell you about my process. I can tell you about what's creative for me, what makes me tick, um, at least as much as I know about that. Um, whether or not that's going to be useful to help you figure out what makes you tick, that I don't know. Um, 
But in order for me to tell you a little bit about um, how I work, I have to tell you a little bit about um, my background, because I don't usually, I don't have the, the usual composer background. The way composers usually become composers, it's because they're, they start on piano when they're very young. Their moms and dads you know, yell at them to practice. And so at some point when they're young, they go, why am I letting these dead composers from the past tell me what to do? I'd rather do it myself. And then they start doing things for themselves. And so gradually, they move from being musicians into being composers. For me, it's completely not that way. I grew up in a family that had no classical music in it, almost no classical music. Um, my parents listened to Montavani albums. They listened to jazz. They listened to Alan Sherman records. You know, we had we had a very we we had show tunes. We had lots of interesting kinds of things, um, but there was not really very much classical music. My parents um, were hardworking, education-oriented, um, first-generation um, immigrants from Central Europe. So my father's family had come from Lithuania right before he was born. My mother was born in Germany. And their families were the way immigrant families were, which is you know, education, family, work hard, you know, get a profession, don't waste your time. You know, um, arts are really nice, but actually, you got to work really hard. You know? <laughs> so that was my background. Um, and I liked my parents. I'm not trying to say anything bad about them. You know, they were really nice. Um, but it never was supposed to be that I was supposed to be a musician. So there were no musical instruments in my house. When I was nine years old, this is a very revealing story, and it's very embarrassing, but it actually is the truth about how I became a musician. When I was nine years old, it was raining at my elementary school in Los Angeles. And so I went to school. It's raining. We couldn't play in the yard. So to keep all the kids quiet, they put us in the auditorium during lunchtime. And they showed us a movie of these great concerts that Leonard Bernstein used to do with the New York Philharmonic, the Young Persons Concerts. So you know, and this was a great time in America. Leonard Bernstein was on television talking to our nation about why classical music was good, right? So I didn't know anything about it. I, I, didn't, I hadn't been to an orchestra. I didn't know anything about it. Um, it's raining. We're there. We're eating lunch. They put this um, movie on of Leonard Bernstein conducting the New York Philharmonic. And he's talking to us, you know, to children, directly to us. And everyone is like throwing their lunches and throwing their things. And everyone is you know, being completely ridiculous. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh, there are people doing something. That's really cool. But then he said the kicker, which was, OK, now we're going to play a piece of music. We're going to play the first symphony by the composer Dmitry Shostakovich. And he said, Shostakovich wrote this piece when he was 19 years old, and he became world famous overnight. And I remember thinking, I have 10 years. <laughs> and so I, it really just hit me, oh, composing. You can do this. A young person could do this. That's really great. And the reason why that's revealing is because this is still the way I operate. So, and it's, a, you know, I, I wrote a film score this year. Um, there's a film which is coming out this fall um, by the Italian director Paolo Sorrentino, who did this film, The Great Beauty, a few years ago. And the Great Beauty used my music in it, which was really nice. And um, this film that's coming out, um, it stars Michael Caine as the world's greatest composer. And I got to write all of his music, which was really great. <laughs> so, um, so my wife, who of course knows more about me than just the story about Shostakovich when I was nine years old, um, when I got this gig, um, she was very seriously um, looked at me and she said, um, you know, um, it's going to get busy for you when the film um, opens up in America. So you should probably write your Academy Award speech now. <laughs> um, so I did. <laughs> you know? And I'm not going to give it to you, but I have to tell you, it's a killer. <laughs> um, 
anyway, um, so that's my personality, right? But the reason why I bring this up is because I was not made to be a musician. I was not programmed that way. Even in college, I was a chemistry student as an undergraduate because I was supposed to go to medical school like my dad, right? <laughs> And what that means is, though, even though I've been completely immersed in classical music, and even though my nerd credentials are very high in classical music, I've always felt like I'm an observer of classical music. I'm a little bit from the outside. I watch things that happen in classical music, and I love them. It's my world. It's my life. But I also ask myself why it is we accept the things we accept. Why it is the things that we built, the institutions we have, why are they like that? Why are the things that we do in classical music not challenged? You know, why do we think about music in terms of what worked for previous generations or worked for people from 100 years ago? And I think part of that is because my background um, was supposed to be not a musician. You know, I still feel a little bit like an outsider, which is ridiculous to say since you know, I'm about as inside as you can get. Um, OK, so that's the preamble to, to my story. Um, music, its secret powers of good <laughs> and evil. OK, so um, and again, you know, it's like I, all of my pieces, all of my process comes from looking at things in the world and going, why is it we don't challenge that? Why is it we accept that without thinking about it more deeply? Um, OK, music, its secret powers for good and evil. So um, I listen to NPR every morning. So I don't know about anybody else here. So National Public Radio. Um, my alarm clock, I wake up early every morning. My alarm clock is set. Um, every morning, NPR comes on, and it wakes me up. So I listen to the news every morning, and I've done this for the last probably 40 years. I've listened to NPR every morning. You know, the news is almost always bad, right? So you turn on the news, whatever, whenever, but you know, you wake up in the middle of the night, you're tired, you're dreaming, you're sleepy, the news comes on, you wake up, and the first thing you hear is bad news every single day. So I remember a day, probably about 15 years ago, when something really interesting happened. The radio turned on, and this really great music was on. It wasn't bad news. It wasn't, um, oh, there's a horrible fight here, or this explosion here, or this terrorist thing, or this disaster, or this war. It was this really catchy music. It was really great. It was this really great African music. Guitars, singing, pop. It was really great. I love African music. It's really great, really fun to dance to, really great. I heard this music. I woke up. I was in a really good mood. And then I started listening to what the story was. And the story was that this was music by a composer and a band leader from Rwanda named Simon Bikindi. And it said, this is this really great music that's really catchy that's really fantastic, that's really enjoyable. Now let's listen to the lyrics. The lyrics are, Hutus are great, let's go kill some Tutsi, right? That's basically what the lyrics were. The lyrics were about Hutu pride and inciting people to um, uh, go and do violence to their neighbor. And what was really interesting to me, so I'm lying there and I'm trying to, like, figure this out. You know, I'm hearing this horrible news, right? Here are these really horrible songs that I'm really enjoying, you know? The reason why this was on the radio that day was because this composer, Simon Bikindi, had just been apprehended and was going to go on trial in the um, international court in The Hague for war crimes because his music was used to incite people to genocide. And to this day, Simon Bikindi is a composer who is in prison for genocide. 
And if you think about it, um, that's power for a composer, right? I don't know any other composer whose music has had that power, right? It's really horrible to think about it, right? Here is this music that's really catchy, and what did it do? It opened people up to receiving a message, because that's what music does. Music um, is something, you know, we like to think that music is good. We like to think that music is something that's about flowers and peace and butterflies and love. But actually, music is very neutral. Music is a pathway between people to communicate things that can't be communicated with language, that can't be communicated by specific ideas. It's about communicating um, these more kind of animal things. And there are also things that are communicated that have to do with our relationships to groups. That's why um, music can be used in religion. Music can be used in politics. Music can be used on television to sell you toothpaste, to make you buy a car. What music does is it does not tell you if something is good or if something is bad. All it does is it opens you up to receive a message. And what that message is, is up to the composer. So obviously, the example of the Rwandan genocide is an extreme. Um, at least I hope it's an extreme. Of course, you know, music is associated with all sorts of horrible things. I'm sure there's music playing at the Republican debate this very evening. So, um, you know, music is used um, to do all sorts of terrible things, right? Um, but the real point of it is then, if you are a composer, that puts an extra responsibility on you. Because then you have to figure um, if what I am doing, whether I want to or not, is opening people up to receive a message, then I have to be really careful about what that message is. I have to know what that message is. I have to think about that message. I have to pay attention to that message. And in music, there are certain messages that we accept without questioning. We go to a movie. Um, you know, uh, a, a dog looks like it's going to get hit by a car, and the exciting and horrible music swells up, and we all burst into tears. You know, um, that's something that the music helped us receive. The music told us to be open to receive a really sad message. And the really interesting thing about music is it's completely unmediated by your intelligence. Because in those moments when you see something tragic happen in a movie and the music swells up, the smart people cry and the stupid people cry. <laughs> it's not about our intelligence. It's something else. It's some other kind of connection. Um, and so one of the things that I try to think about as a composer is, um, how do I feel about that then? If we are in the presence of things all the time, if we're surrounded by music all the time, that's trying to use, it, use music's opening power to get us to do something that may even be against our will, to cry at this moment, to laugh at this moment, to buy this car, to vote for this politician, um, then um, maybe it would become noble in music to try to make a kind of music which doesn't manipulate you. So um, if we think about opera, for example, you know, if you see a Verdi opera, right? You know, operas are about plot. And plot is about you not knowing things, right? So it's about you um, discovering something with 3,000 other people at a, and, and finding out information at exactly the same moment. You know, someone gets a letter with information, you read the letter, you hear about what's in the letter, it completely changes your environment, the music changes radically, everyone in the audience feels exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. On the one hand, that's unbelievably satisfying to have that feeling. And it's also incredibly manipulative. So one of the things that I started thinking many years ago was maybe for me what would make 
um, me feel like I am participating in a noble field is to remove as much of the manipulation from the piece of music as I could. So an example for me is um, I wrote a piece, uh, a, uh, a piece in memory of a friend of mine. I wanted to write this gigantic, beautiful orchestra piece in memory of a very close friend who died at a very early age. And so I was trying to think, well, what, what is grief in classical music? You know, it's very traditional for people to write pieces in memory of people. And there are pieces like the Verdi Requiem, whatever, which is this gigantic public statement of people coming together to agree that things are horrible. And I thought, you know, actually, that's also very manipulative to say we're all here, we're all feeling this big emotion. Um, I want to actually just make it possible for people to feel whatever emotion they want to feel at this moment. You know, I knew this person, you didn't know this person. Why should I make you feel terrible just because I feel terrible? You know, what I should tell you is I want to be in a place where I can sit in a room for 45 minutes and listen to something that's really beautiful and meditative, and I want to think my thought. And I also want to make it open enough for you to think whatever thought you're going to think. So I wrote a piece of music called The Passing Measures, which is 45 minutes long and is one beautiful chord that falls very slowly the distance of a fourth, which is not a very large interval. It takes 45 minutes to do it. And, um, and the whole point of it was that it, it would not be um, telling you what experience to have or telling you exactly what moment you were supposed to have it in. It would just be something that says, you know, I am in a contemplative space, and I invite you, if you feel like it, to be in a contemplative space, too. And to me, this felt um, more honest, more noble, and again, you know, less manipulative. Um, so that's basically um, how I, I operate. Is I think about things that classical music does without um, questioning. So this idea of making everyone feel the same thing at the same time is a very acceptable and powerful and successful idea. And I'm trying to do something else. So um, I, I can give you other examples of this. And eventually, we're going to play some live music, which will be another example of one of these things. But, um, but um, I will tell you about this other range of pieces that I have done as an example. And then we'll get on to some real music. Um, so we are um, constantly surrounded by music, which we did not choose. Most of the music in you, your life, if you think about it, you did not choose it. So most of the music that comes on, you hear it in the radio. You hear it in the elevator. You hear it on television. You hear it in a movie. You hear it from the you know, person's iPhone next to you who's playing too loud that you want to yell at for not putting in headphones, but um, you don't. Um, you know, you hear a lot of music every single day that's music you did not choose. So, so um, I think about this all the time because I think my world is surrounded by, um, by technology that makes it possible for me to have music all the time. Um, and if you think about how this relates to us as um, people who grew up with live performance, what does that mean? It means that um, this action of going to see a live concert, of seeing music performed in front of you, is something which we um, think is interchangeable with the recorded media. You know, most of the music in the world you hear recorded. Most of it you hear, um, you know, even for me, who I, I love concerts and I'm out all the time, and most of the music I hear, I hear on my computer. I hear on YouTube, I hear on Spotify, I put on CDs. Um, you know, so even though I'm a live music groupie, um, I, uh, I end up hearing most of my music recorded. And what that means is you hear your music perfectly balanced, you hear your music um, presented in the perfect environment for you to do the dishes while you are doing it. And you can drink a beer while you are you know, listening to it or not listening to it. You can tune in. You can tune out. But it also means that um, every piece is completely balanced and completely polished. So I started thinking, 
if live performance is at the core of what we do as classical musicians, if that's what really ties us to our past and makes our field special, um, how can you make music so that it can only be experienced live? What are the things that can only happen live that recording cannot capture? So um, the piece I wrote that won the Pulitzer Prize is a piece called The Little Match Girl Passion. And I thought one thing that happens um, is a religious experience. You know, you go to church or you go to temple or you go to mosque or whatever, and these there are sounds there and there are musics there that take advantage of the fact that people are all there paying attention to a text. So I thought, I can, I can make a piece of music that's exactly like this, you know. It's not going to be um, uh, about a religion. It's not going to be about Jesus. Um, that was the odd thing about my, my piece that won the Pulitzer Prize is, um, uh, you know, I thought, uh, you know, again, I, I love classical music, but classical music um, for much of our history has been about music, um, which is celebrating Jesus because not only because all the composers from uh, European Western tradition were Christians, but also because that was their employer. So Bach wrote all of this incredible music, both because he was an incredible Christian and also because he was paid every week to write music about Jesus. That was his living. So, I mean, it was just a nice coincidence for him that he was a very devout Christian. Um, but. But the church has been the number one employer for um, classical music over the years. And because of that, many of our great pieces are about Christianity. What that means for a student or for a lover of classical music is that you spend a huge amount of time studying the worship of Jesus as a classical musician. And you get Bach's um, intensity and passion and his commitment and his belief in the music, and it's very persuasive and it's very important. But there is one slight problem, is that not everyone who studies this music is Christian. I am not a Christian. And so for all of my time growing up as a, someone who is completely immersed in classical music, I have, um, always had this incredible distance between um, what I am uh, loving and, and studying and respecting and how much I can believe it myself. So um, uh, I wondered what it would be like to try to design a project that took those things out of the gospel story, which might be universal, and, um, and see if, um, if I could make them more universal, if I could take the thing out of the gospel and, um, and charge it so that more people could get something out of it. Um, because usually what happens is that, you know, it's like you listen to these pieces and, you know, I sang in a Gregorian chant choir um, in a Catholic church in college. I've sung, you know, the B minor mass, I've sung the Verdi Requiem, I've sung, you know, um, all of these pieces. You know, I, I love all these pieces and I, I really respect them, but, you know, um, um, how should I say this? You know, um, a piece like the St. Matthew Passion, you know, it's not good for the Jews, as we say. Um, so, um, so there's always a moment where I go, uh, you know, it's like there's, there's some place here I can't get. So I wondered if I could make a piece that I could get into and maybe other people could get into as well. So I went to the St. Matthew Passion and I took the crowd scenes where the crowds surrounding the crucifixion of Jesus are watching that and, um, and they're reacting to it and they're noticing the suffering of this man and saying, um, you know, noticing the suffering of this man challenges us to be better people, to be better citizens, to be better um, members of our society. Um, it calls us to, be, um, to live on a higher plane. What would it be like if you could have exactly those same reactions but not have them reacting to the death of Jesus, but to the death of somebody else. So I took the Jesus story out, and I was looking around for another story, and I put in the story of the little match girl by Hans Christian Andersen. So the story of the, the little, you know, poor, starving beggar girl um, who freezes to death in plain view of um, her surroundings and no one helps her. And then um, would it be possible to notice her death 
and have that challenge you and raise you up to a more spiritual level. Or maybe that would do the opposite and it would trivialize the whole religious experience. It was sort of an experiment. I didn't really know. I didn't know if I was doing you know, something that would get my house firebombed or if I was doing something you know, that was um, you know, going to get me the Pulitzer Prize. But I guess, you know, I guess I got the Pulitzer Prize. Um, <laughs> Although I will say, when it did win the Pulitzer Prize, um, when it was announced on Fox television, there was a little you know, banner that ran underneath that said, composer wins Pulitzer by taking Jesus out of the Gospels. <laughs> um, which, which was the truth. Um, but anyway, this is a long way of, um, of getting back to this thing of um, how you make a kind of music which um, preferences live performance. So that was one way to do it, is to take um, the thing that we need to come together um, in a group for, in a religious environment, and use a piece of music to kind of mimic that. Another way was to think, um, you know, one thing that you will never hear recorded, or you will never see on YouTube, or you will never, um, or you'll almost never see on YouTube, um, or you should never see on YouTube, is, um, is someone who is playing a piece of music that they mess up. Right? No one would make a studio recording and spend all that money and make, make a recording in which there are mistakes, in which they can't play it, in which they're no good, in which they fail, in which the job that they um, are trying to accomplish is unaccomplishable. No one will do that. So I have a series of pieces that are too hard for people to play, that are actually um, the point of the piece of music is for someone to struggle. So I have a very, very difficult piece for solo trombone and ensemble. And the trombone is actually in places given instructions to play notes longer than someone can breathe. And the incredible thing is that it's made so that every time the trombone drops out, you hear it. You know, the person is supposed to feel lousy playing this piece. <laughs> but, but the reason why it's interesting is because then what you get in a live performance is you get the struggle for someone to accomplish something. You get the conflict between the ideal and the actual. And to me, um, not only is that a very dramatic proposition, but it's also something that can only happen live. Last year, I wrote a piece of music, um, again, on this whole thing of trying to think, how do we make live performance the core of what we do in classical music? And I thought, um, I'm going to make a piece of music that's so quiet that it can't be recorded. So I made a piece of music called The Whisper Opera. And, um, and I was premiered at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. And it was at Lincoln Center this past year. And it's gone to many other places. Um, but the whole idea of it was that the musicians and the singer, there's one principal singer and a bunch of other musicians, that the entire text is whispered. And the players and the singer move around. And so what happens is that for maybe a few small moments, the text comes into focus as someone walks by you, and you get a little inkling about what it's about. But you can't possibly have the whole experience. Um, and so it says in the score that you can't record it, you can't video it, you can't broadcast it, you can't archive it, you can't perform it if it's not staged, you can't stage it in a way so that people are, um, so that there's more than one row around the stage. Um, and the original way I got this gig, actually, now that I think about it, is um, I went to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and I said, I have a project for you. Um, I want to do this opera, and only 10 people can see it at a time. And it's so quiet that no one will be able to hear it. And I have no advanced materials for you to be able to put in your program to sell tickets. And you're going to lose a huge amount of money. And he said, great, I'll sign up right now. You know? um, so anyway, so this is the kind of um, way that I think. You know, there are problems. There are things in the world that we take for granted, and I want to you know, sort of imagine that there are giant wounds that I can stick my finger right in. So this leads me to the piece which we're going to hear live. So we're going to hear a piece now called Sweet Air. Um, and this is a piece that I wrote. Um, it's actually um, dedicated to my son, 
who is a student here at the University of Iowa right now. But this actually was an incident in his life from a very, very long time ago. Um, his first cavity. Um, he had a cavity. We went to the dentist. He was very young. The dentist gave him laughing gas so that he wouldn't feel any pain um, when they were digging out the cavity. And the dentist called the laughing gas sweet air. And it came in flavors. I think he was offered um, apple, strawberry. I mean, it was so great. And there was a little mask that was the color of the flavor that you got. Like, it was a green mask for apple, a red mask for strawberry. So he chose strawberry. He had the red mask. He had this incredibly delicious strawberry smell. It was really fantastic. He got the laughing gas. They um, fixed his cavity, no problem. And when it was over, he said, that was fun. Can we do it again? <laughs> and what was interesting about that for me as a parent was sometimes as a parent, you want those things to hurt. You want to actually have the lesson be, you know, if you don't brush your teeth, <laughs> it's going to be painful. And in fact, it's possible to say, we learn the lesson from the pain. We don't learn the lesson from the thing that takes the pain away. And yet, that's how we use music. For many of us, something bad happens to us. We have music that calms us down. Something terrible happens to us. We listen to music. Um, I remember I had a girlfriend who broke up with me in college. I went right home. I put on Mahler's 10th Symphony. I turned it up really loud. I felt terrible and great, you know? But the interesting thing about it is what we need as people in order to learn from um, the bad things that happen to us is to really feel the bad things that happen to us. And we say that we like music because it keeps us from doing that. So I wondered how to make a piece of music that would be about this. You know, how could I make a piece of music called Sweet Ear that would be about this? So I made a piece of music which was about these long phrases which have these very consonant fronts. And gradually as the phrases get longer and longer, they have a few little dissonant notes which um, creep in. And as they layer on top of each other, the idea is that you um, are constantly given this very consonant front that has this slightly um, dissonant haze shimmering in the background. And that's my piece, Sweet Air. And so now, I think we're going to hear it. So I want to introduce the musicians. So please welcome Andrew Ginch, violin, Emily Duncan, flute, Christine Burke, clarinet, Matthew Laughlin, cello, Korak, piano, and Zach Stanton, conductor. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, so we've reached the part of the evening which is called question and answer. <laughs> In case you have some questions and I have some answers. I have a question. Okay. Is this sweet air of apple or strawberry? Excuse me? Is this sweet air of apple or strawberry? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it feels kind of watermelon to me. <laughs> But that might change. Um, and you don't have to ask any questions. <laughs> yes? I'm curious how some of the musicians felt about yeah. playing the piece. Uh, how did some of the musicians feel while playing the piece? <coughs> because it's not an easy piece to play. It is relaxing in some way. It is relaxing in some ways. You have to concentrate really hard, though. <laughs> I think it's definitely more fun to listen to than it is to play. Well, you guys to a point. It's very hypnotic, which is, you get to a point it is. Yeah, we were talking, we, we didn't know how long it was. Yeah. Like, we, no, nobody could say. I think it's like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> but it went by really bad. <laughs> instruments can hear them, 
and then the orchestral instruments overwhelm the original idea, destroying it. So the opening of the piece is um, the four percussionists playing amplified twigs, which they snap which was really fun. We actually had to audition you know, hundreds of different kinds of twigs. <laughs> um, and eventually we settled on, uh, on the sticks that you um, use in, in, uh, in planters to keep um, you know, um, flowers growing straight. Um, and so um, I wrote out these incredible rhythms for these amplified twigs, and I worked out this great theatrical thing for them how long they hold them, how they drop them, what they do is very choreographed, it is super fun. And what happens is that then the wooden instruments in the percussion section hear them, and they start playing the wood blocks and the marimba and the xylophone, then the rest of the orchestra can hear that, and then it becomes so loud that, um, that you can't hear the original twigs any longer, and then they moved on to tune wine bottles, then they move on to pieces of metal, um, trash cans, which is awesome. Um, uh, anyway, so I'm not, there are definitely composers who are uh, interested in, in, the, in the natural world for its own virtues and for its own sounds, but I'm interested in it um, for, again, for its connection to classical music, for how things from that world, you know, I'm interested in it from how, from, from a classical musician's they have been pastoral symphony, you know, which has so many imitations of things from nature. Um, what does it mean when, a, when, a, when you go to a concert hall in a, in a major city, uh, like Vienna in the 1820s, and you hear Beethoven's symphony, it means, oh, we live in a city. We, we don't have nature anymore. Let's have this nostalgic idea about what nature was, you know, and then we bring nature sound. So it's that kind of thing, you know, it's, um, I'm really, so I'm classical music focused. So. Yes? Uh, I was thinking really hard about uh, what you said in the beginning, uh, and uh, I was thinking, for instance, uh, Beethoven's Ode to Joy, it's, a, it's an Ode to Joy, and it's loved by many dictators uh, from the left and from the right, even though its messages are positive. Yeah. I was thinking, uh, are you concerned that maybe your music, no matter how much you try, are, is going to be used in the future by uh, evil, <laughs> in evil matters? <laughs> are you thinking, and if uh, uh, music is, uh, instrumental music is not like uh, an empty container, like shaped by ideology? So, if a dictator uses my music, will my kids get royalties? <laughs> <laughs> This is a really interesting story. I just have to tell this. I, I'll answer your question eventually, but I just thought of this thing. You know, the way composers make money, you know, it's like when you play music, you have to pay for the rights to the music, right? You have to pay royalties. So, and we sign contracts with certain organizations to collect our royalties for us. So, one of the major ones is called ASCAP, and there's BMI. There are all these other things. They're rights agencies. They, they watch after the rights of their music. So, um, uh, theoretically, any music that's played, that's written by someone and owned by someone, um, you need to pay a license to play it. So this piece, this university, University of Iowa, has a blanket license with ASCAP and with BMI so that they can play any music from that catalog. When you go into a bar sometimes or a restaurant that has the radio on, sometimes you'll notice a little sticker in the door it says ASCAP, you know, um, because they have to pay a license because they're using music. So um, back uh, when, um, at the beginning of the um, war in Afghanistan, and prisoners started being brought back to Guantanamo, and it was said in the paper that we've collected these prisoners and we are using means of coercion on them to try to get their cooperation to tell us what they are doing. So the army was using loud rock and roll to keep them from going to sleep um, so that we would break down their spirit and they would tell us all their secrets of evil world domination. 
um, ASCAP read that and they called the army and they said, <laughs> excuse me, I understand you are torturing people with our music. <laughs> Do you have a license? <laughs> so anyway, that was a little side bit. Um, you know, to me, the really interesting thing about music is you, um, you can't say something specific with it. I can't make a piece of music that makes you, you know, like I can't play a piece of music that you go, um, oh yeah, turn left at the street, go down, pick up a quarter mill, do that in five minutes, right? You know, you can't get that specific information. So what you're doing is you're um, proposing something that's, um, that needs you to complete it. Right? I tell my students that you think that the act of composing is what you do in your studio, but actually the act of composing is you opening a conversation with someone and they're receiving it. And that's composition. And you as a composer are responsible for all the parts of it, both the, the beginning part and the receiving part. So I make this vague thing, I offer it to you, and you have to receive it. And how you receive it, I can't control.